The first time our church hosted a Super Bowl party was the Justin Timberlake, Janet Jackson halftime show. We never hosted one again. Damn, Hey everyone, welcome to episode four of season two of Unlearning Youth Group. We're the podcast where we take a look at all the things we learned back in youth group. We find the good, we unlearn the bad, and we figure out where the heck we go from here. We haven't met. My name is Jonathan Carone, and I am joined as always by Mr. Eric Williams, who's a co-host of the show. Eric, can you say hey to the people? What's up, people? Excited to get another episode under our belt, especially with a topic that uh, I think is really important we need to talk about. Yeah, today we're talking about mental health. So uh, depression, anxiety, shame, if you've got any of those in your past and those are issues for you, Mm -hmm. um, we'll go ahead and tell you on the front end that we're talking about those. Uh, Hopefully you can stay with us on this. Uh, We're going to handle things pretty delicately, but um, if that's something you don't need to be hearing about, then I totally understand if you stop listening now and uh, go play on TikTok for 30 minutes because that'll probably be better for you then us putting you in a bad place. Mm -hmm. But if you're new to the show, each week we pick a topic from back in youth group, something that we were taught about or not taught about or whatever it is. We intro the topic, which we'll do here in just a second. We'll talk about all the details of it. And then from there, we, we talk about what was bad about how we handled that. Uh, Where do we go wrong? What do we need to unlearn? After we discuss that for a few minutes, we're going to try to find the good in it because the people teaching us, or uh, if you're like Eric and I, we both were in student ministry at one point in time. We have mm-hmm. taught these things that are harmful or bad, or just with some space and some time to look back, some hindsight, we realize, you know what? Our hearts were in the right place, but we did that pretty terribly. So we'll talk about what yeah. the good intentions were. And then finally, we're going to figure out where the heck we go from here. Because if you're listening to this podcast, you likely are going to be leading something at some point in time, mm-hmm. whether that's your children, whether that is your student ministry leader now, or will be in the future. We want to make sure we train the next generation up in a better way than we were. Not that our leaders did anything purposely wrong for us, but hopefully we train our kids better. They train their kids better and we keep making the world a better place as we move forward. So as we talk about mental health, Eric, can you give us an intro and an idea of what we're talking about with that? Yeah. So first let's talk about terms here. You know, Jonathan and I, we're, we're learning this, this, um, topic is constantly evolving. So when we talk through mental health, we talk through mental health issues. We talk about if you have a a diagnosed condition, some of those words and phrases we might be using interchangeably, but Uh, basically we're talking about anything regarding mental health from the side of like, uh, I, I struggle with, uh, anxiety to, I'm actually diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Like there's a wide, wide range here. So, um, just bear with us as we use those terms, but essentially the entire topic is tough to talk about, especially in the church, because the church as a whole has been notoriously bad at addressing it, um, notoriously bad at allowing space for it. And there's even going to the even worse side, there are stigmas involved with mental health that fortunately have started to get better, but in a lot of circles and a lot of churches, they are still very much stigmatized and, uh, and it's not moving in a positive direction as fast, uh, as it should, but it's definitely faster than like, if we were to talk to our parents or if you have older siblings, you know, what happened when we were generation. in college. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially even when we were in college, like there was, we'll talk a little bit more about the bad side associated with it. But, um, I think what's, what's happening now is there's, there's more of an awareness of this hidden issue with people or something that just wasn't being dealt with in general. And, you know, I've got it later in the notes, but I think this is probably the best time to talk about it is we have very male and masculine centric churches, uh, very, you know, men led, which is good for a lot of ways, bad in a lot of other ways. And I think when it comes to mental health, um, because we have a masculine view of some things and it's led in a masculine way, a lot of times the toxic side of that masculinity gets in, especially when it comes to mental health. So if you say I'm struggling with 
uh, depression, um, or I'm sad about something like for me, I mean, I just lost my mom a couple of months ago. And so even going through the process of mourning, there are times that you're told to just suck it up, be a man, don't cry, don't this, don't that. Oh, you're on medication. Oh, you're seeing a therapist. Like it's stigmatized because of the side of toxic masculinity that I think starts to um, invade some of the, the, the male centric versions of Christianity. And growing up, I never even considered the idea that you could be Christian and depressed at the same time. Right. It was never presented to me. And I grew up in a very conservative town, very conservative church that depression was something that no, quote unquote normal people dealt with. I thought it was mm -hmm. anything mental health was just, if you went to counseling, if you went to therapy, if you dealt with stuff, that's just what the crazy people did. Right. And if we're following Jesus, we're not going to have those crazy people or those crazy things in our life because Jesus is going to make it all better was kind of the, the world that I was brought up around. So mm -hmm. when I got to college and on my own for the first time. Um, I can get into my, more of my story in a different time, but um, all through undergrad, the big idea was I was running from this call to ministry that I kind of knew I had, but my grandpa was a pastor and I wanted nothing to do with it. So there, there's that piece of it, but there was a depression that I felt all throughout college at different times, but I didn't realize it was a depression. Hmm. Because again, I never thought that Christians could be depressed. I just thought I was tired all the time that I would be out and like, Oh, you know what? I'm just tired. I'm gonna go home. Mm -hmm. And, um, way back when, um, I wrote a note on Facebook when those were things like it went from right, right, yeah. Sanga to yeah. live journal, to MySpace to Facebook note. notes. Yeah. So we, we were in the Facebook note portion of social media at that point. But I, I wrote in, I said, this, I pro this was probably 06, 07. Um, so somewhere around there, I said, lately I've been getting in those same moods I got over Christmas break. I hate it. I don't know why I slip into them. I just do. The past two nights it happened while I was with some friends and I ended up coming home. The typical I need to go to bed excuse came up. But as you can tell from me writing this, I didn't go to bed. I'm tired of having to use the I'm tired and need to go to bed excuse. I want to actually stay out until I'm tired. I'm tired of being the first leader. I'm tired of making excuses. I'm just tired of it all. And with 14 years of perspective and thankfully where mental health has gone in that time, I now look back and I realize that was depression. Yeah. That was a, a sign of that. A few years later, um, got dumped, lost my job, went into a grad school program I hated and uh, that's when I realized I was depressed, yep. but I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know how to get counseling. I didn't know how to do anything to combat depression. I didn't know who I could talk to because I grew up in a church environment. And by the way, if you don't know my story, this is all happening at Liberty University, the world's go. largest Christian university. And I felt this way. So uh, you can imagine, I can, and I can imagine how other people in the similar environments felt going through unhealthy situations mentally and not knowing what to do about it. Yeah. It's even with the labels that we use, you know, the fact that uh, society has progressed to talk about it as mental health instead of just a mental illness. Um, right. And so I even think like back in that time when you would have been in college or when I, you know, even earlier when I was in high school and things like that. Um, they're probably, you probably weren't thinking that a Christian, that you could be a Christian who struggles with depression or a Christian, um, who has mental health problems. You were just labeled as, like you said, the crazy person. Oh, she, you know, she's this, or he's that. And now your label becomes whatever that, you know, oh, he's, he's depressed or whatever. And it's, it's not, not a healthy way. And we just didn't really have good ways to talk about it at all. I had a friend in high school. She was a year ahead of me. She was going to Christian counseling because her parents were getting a divorce. And I was so, I don't want to say shocked, but it felt so foreign that someone would be going to counseling for something, right. much less Christian counseling. I'm like, what is like, it was such a foreign concept. 
right. that my brain could not compute it. Yeah. So think about it going back. I mean, I would put it in like the realm of like the 1920s, like let's think 1920s and thirties when you would think about what exercise and physical health looks like now before uh, Bill Bowerman wrote his book about jogging and like recreational running, like uh, you had no reason to do cardio. You had no reason to go like a gym. A gym was literally a place, a big open building that had gymnastics equipment in it. There was no, you know, like there wasn't recreational physical health being taken care of. And so people would only go there if they had like, oh, you are an athlete or you have a problem or you'd go to like, and I, and this is a a terrible term, but I'm going to use it. You would go to like a fat farm, right? To take care of it when you had a problem. Now we look at working out and physical health in the way of preventative care or in the way of keeping you well and keeping you healthy. And I think that that's even been the progress made in mental health um, outside of the church is like, you know, imagine this might even be weird. Like if, if you heard that a, a friend of yours, a couple friend were going to marriage counseling now, You'd be like, oh, what's wrong? What happened? What did they do? What, you know, uh, he Who cheated. She, yeah, right. That sort of situation. When in reality, like nowadays people can go to therapy and they go to counseling to stay regulated, to stay healthy in the same way as you would go to work out every, well, I mean, you probably wouldn't go to counseling every day, but where you go to work out every day, it's like, I go to work out every day, not necessarily because there's anything wrong with me physically, but because I want to maintain good physical health. And so that concept in the 1920s and 30s would have been completely foreign to them in the same way as like now somebody in the church saying, yeah, I see my, I see a therapist once a week. Well, what's wrong with you? nothing. And that's the point is I want to make sure nothing's wrong. It's, it's as crazy as going like, yeah, I mean, my, my wife and I, we go on dates once a week dates. Why would you go on dates? You're married now. You don't need to. Well, yeah, cause we want to stay married and stay connected. And that's, what's important about mental health is the, is the positive um, preventative or maintenance side of mental health as well has, has shifted that I'm not sure that the church is, is ready to, uh, to catch on to. I mean, my story is different than yours. I mean, I dealt with, with mental health issues starting in middle school. And so I was medicated. I was seeing doctors all through middle school, high school and college, but I wasn't attending church regularly. And so when I stepped into church volunteering and going to church regularly, starting in college, the stigma around mental health was very foreign to me because I was like, I, I mean, I'm on medication, you know, like I'm seeing people, I, I have to bring my issues to the forefront. Otherwise it's not going to be healthy. And to see that, like, now that I was stepping into volunteer roles in the church and, you know, quote unquote leadership roles in the church as a college student, I was actively told not to tell people that you struggle with depression or not to tell people that you're medicated for these things. And it was like, because there would be some risk of, I don't know, whatever the risk was. Yeah. And the problem with that, that's in the, I, it's almost ironic in a bad way in an Alanis Morissette type of way. Mm -hmm. um, depression's all over the Bible. Yeah. If, if we look at it, especially in the old Testament, uh, David was depressed at times. You look at Psalm 51, you look at second Samuel 15. Um, when David's son died because of his sin with Bathsheba, like some of those Psalms are written out of a depressed standpoint. Um, he is at his lowest. His mental health is terrible, but we, for some reason, didn't bother thinking through that. Um, if you look at Elijah, Elijah said, I have had enough, Lord, take my life. I am not better than my ancestors. That's not a very healthy place to be mentally, but yet we just glossed over that and acted like it would. Uh, Jonah and Job. I mean, those are books of the Bible that were written from guys that were not in great places. And then um, I mean, you could even bring up Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. So there's all these signs in the Bible that mental health has been around and mental issues and unhealthy mental places have been around since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And yet for some reason, I think, Eric, what you mentioned is, is right that overly masculine approach to the point of toxic led to the fact that, you know what, suck it up, throw some dirt on it, pull yourself up. You can do it. Mm -hmm. You don't need help. Jesus is all you need. Yeah. Which is ironic because if you look at Mark 14, 
Jesus literally says in the garden, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. If, if that doesn't say like, you know, whether it's clinical depression or not, if that doesn't say a struggle with a mental battle for Christ. And mental health isn't just depression, right? It's anxiety. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something that is always bad. You can right. go through times where it's like, you know what? I've been reading my, I can't say that word because we chose not to custom this po podcast, but my uh, back crap, crazy <laughs> local Facebook group yeah, and all the craziness going on there that they're saying that the reason Bojangles is out of chicken is because of the new world order and those things. Mm -hmm. Like if I read too much of that, my mental health is in a bad place. That yeah. doesn't mean I'm depressed. Right. It doesn't mean, but it just means that I'm not in a healthy place mentally. And you see even that verse in Mark where Jesus is like, I'm not doing good. Right. Like, he, he literally I tells, he tells his best friends, can you stay up with me? I know that I need community right now. Stay up with me a little while, while I'm suffering through this mental anguish. And so that's one side. And I love that you brought up Job because like Job too, like his wife is the epitome of what not to do, but it's what the church does. Right. He says, uh, she says, uh, Job two, nine, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. What? Just go <laughs> ahead and kill yourself. Like what? Literally his own wife is the epitome of what we shouldn't do. But yet in the church, that's the, that's the mentality that we take is the, you're not strong enough. You're not tough enough. Your faith isn't strong enough. There must be something wrong with you. You need to pray harder. Um, you know, you need to step away for a while, which is weird too. It's like when you're in a depressed state, you know what, maybe you should step down from some of the, from, from volunteering and from leadership and other things like that. It's like, wait, so you want to disconnect me from community? That's you what you want to shun me because I'm not yes. healthy. Yeah, add shame on top to that thing, and then here's uh, this. This may be a little bit too far for some of us, so you know, warning for some of you church leaders. We never talk about the mental health problem of anger and of jealousy. We talk about it in a sermon in a way how it's sin and how you know blah 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 blah. But guess what, dudes? How many times have you? out of your own self-righteousness and anger, which is a mental health issue. How many of you have just completely blown up on someone else, have made decisions that are self-centered and self-service because you have an insecurity built on your own jealousy, built on your own anger, on your rage? How many of you in public, now again, don't raise your hand if this is you, but I cannot tell you, especially male leaders in the church, how it's like you're one way at church in front of people that you lead, but your family would tell a completely different story about you. And that's sad because we don't want to bring those issues up front and forward to the people that can actually help us because we're afraid of that, uh, that shunning and that stigma attached. And we, it, it's, it's funny because we say we're broken, sinful people right? Yeah. when it comes to outward sins. Mm -hmm. When, oh, somebody has a moral failure, well, we're broken, sinful people. We need right. to pray for that guy. When someone is a jerk to somebody, well, we're broken, sinful people, that, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sorry that happened. But we never take it to that. Like This comes down to Eric, me and you being in marketing, and we yeah. understand this. That's the external problem. Right. We never take it past the external problem of we're broken, sinful people to move to the internal problem of why am I doing that? Right. Yes, I have a sin nature. So what is at the root of that that's causing me to have all this anger? Mm -hmm. What's causing me to have this anxiety that keeps me from doing other things, that keeps me projecting things? What causes right. me to have this depression? Like I can look back 14 years later and realize that the root of a lot of that depression is because I wasn't doing what God had called me to in life. Mm -hmm. Similar to Jonah in, in that situation. I relate a lot to Jonah in a lot of parts of my life because of that. I've been there. And so we never do that. It's broken, sinful people as an excuse, but we don't take the next step to investigate the brokenness that led to those things because right. that's harder. Yeah. And that requires us to open ourselves up more and people may see that we're actually broken, sinful people. Yeah. And that's not just lip service. And I think part of it too, is like, we also will not admit that sometimes 
Uh, for some people, you may have a chemical imbalance that needs to be addressed with medication. I, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I'm a firm believer that that's like, that's okay. You know, as if, as if you don't take ibuprofen or Tylenol for a headache, like you, if you're way more religious than I am and you're way more faithful than I am and you just pray your headache away, great, cool. Or you pray your allergies away. All right, fine. But like for some of us, there is a grandpa would pray over every ibuprofen he took. He would take a Tylenol and ibuprofen. He would say, God, please bless this and use this to heal whatever's going on. Boom. And he'd pop it. Because but he, he believed still that popped God it. God could use science. Yes. And he still, the, the point is he still popped it. You know what I right. mean? It wasn't, it wasn't like he said, uh, God, I see this Tylenol or ibuprofen, but I'm not going to take it because I believe that you are the overcomer and you're the good doctor and uh, like, stop it. So for some people that have an actual chemical imbalance where they need to take care of it for a season or for a lifetime, you take care of it. My oldest son, he's on hundreds of dollars of medication because that's what helps regulate him mentally. And it's like, I would never accept any other Christian or church going, well, you know what? The the problem with your son after he had a stage four um you know cranial bleed before he was born is that you're just not praying hard enough for his mental health. And you're like, get out of here. I will, I will righteously backhand you. Like, I'm not going to take that. So yeah. The old right Sorry. hand of fellowship is what we used to call it. <laughs> That's right. um, but no, like God can use those scientists who came up with that medication so that your son can live life and life to the fullest. Right. God can use a counselor mm-hmm. to help you work through your issues so you can have life and life to the fullest that, but we don't think about the idea that like there's, there's that old story. It's, it's cheesy at this point, but the guy, it, he's in a flood he's on the roof of his house. He prays God, Hey, please save me. A guy in a boat drives down the street and he says, no, my yep. God will save me. Guy in a helicopter comes. No, my God will save me. Guy dies, gets to heaven. God says, well, I sent you a, a, a guy with a radio, a guy with a boat and a guy yep. with a helicopter. Or what else you want me to do? And mm-hmm. so I, we don't think about the idea that God has sent these people in our lives, especially Christian counselors who are trained and who have studied and are licensed, who are led by the spirit of God in their life. We don't think that they are God's healing for our issues because right. it's more than a prayer because right. God forbid he use people to help solve our problems as if that's not what he's been doing since the beginning of time. Yeah. You can't on one hand say, Oh, I blindly trust pastor who's up in the pulpit to interpret the scriptures, to help speak into the issues of my life while also saying, Oh, I don't trust that godly counselor uh, or that godly doctor uh, who's been trained in all of these things to help me with these issues that they've been trained for. Like, because I believe are you implying that Christians else. have a cognitive dissonance between the things they want to believe hmm. and the things they don't want to believe? Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think it's, but it's it's here too because we will be okay with certain sins being something that we talk mm-hmm. about, or like you said, like we generalize it and say, oh yeah, everyone struggles with anger issues, everyone struggles with jealousy and envy, and you know the seven deadly sins or whatever, like. Okay, but then compartmentalize that down and say, great, now what, but what am I actually going to do about the way that I react to my kids or the way that I react to my wife or the way, you know, like, great, cool, let's, let's deal with your specific issues. No, 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 we don't want to do that. Well, we don't want to do that because I think it's going to expose more things. And in the same way we talked a couple episodes ago is like some of the people who speak out the most against the mental health side probably need the most help because they're dealing with anger or jealousy or lust or blah, 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 blah. And as Christians, how are we supposed to help others through their issues if we're not having people help us through ours? Mm -hmm. And it's the idea. I don't know if a lot of people don't think know this. Most counselors and therapists are in therapy themselves. Mm -hmm. And they know that they need counseling and therapy in order to give counseling and therapy to other people. So if we are to make disciples of those around us, to help them understand their problems, we actually have to do the hard work and understanding ours too, because right. like 
I know we mentioned this on a couple episodes ago, the idea of projecting our issues on other people. We don't mm-hmm. want to project on a, on a, in an unhealthy way, but if we see a friend of ours who is dealing with anxiety and we have taken the time to both take it to God and take it to therapy and are working through that and God's using those things to help us, then we can help that other person. God can mm-hmm. use that to be their healing. But we first have to work on ourselves before we can do that. And I had a great uh, colleague. He was a a youth pastor at at another campus within the church I was working at. And he was one of those like, um, uh, you know, kind of lifelong youth pastor guys. So he was older than me. And he talked about the importance of he had a group of, of guys that were outside of the church that he had to meet with. Because I think like if I'm thinking back to me 10 years ago, 20, you know, however long ago it was that I was in in student ministry, like. There are probably student pastors listening to this right now. There are lead pastors listening to this right now. There are executive pastors. There are leaders in the church that you are struggling with the things that you see every day and you hear every day, and you have no idea where to bring it other than to bring it to God, which is great. Because pastors carry a ton of weight. Right. But on the other hand, like, you know, I was just talking to a guy who said, yeah, I think the lead pastor at this church, like going through the pandemic, going through this, going through that, going through people leaving is like that has some PTSD or they use that term PTSD over some of these situations. It's like, who's he talking to? Where's he getting his help from? Oh no, he doesn't need that. Right. It's like there, wouldn't it be great if all of those dudes listening right now and, and women who are in ministry as well, cause you carry weight as well. It's like, but specifically me being a guy speaking to other guys, like if you could just destigmatize that issue, whatever's holding you back from getting help, whatever's holding you back from actually talking about it and being transparent and open, not with everybody, but with somebody and really seeking that help. Not only is that going to make you better, that's going to make your family better. And if you lead a ministry, it's going to make your people better because you're leading by example in that way. Yeah. And it's, we just have to do better on that front. Yeah. We, we, we have to do better. Um, but we've spent 20, 25 minutes talking about the bad. I do want to spend some time talking about the good because there were some good intentions behind the way we did these things. And one of the ones that I think that we need to say, and just so we can say it out loud is that God is capable of helping with our depression and our mental health. Like the Holy spirit is with us today to help with those things. So we cannot do this outside of God. Correct. But it's not solely on us figuring it out with God that like, you know what, God, I need you to help me with my mental health. I need you to help me with this mm-hmm. depression. Take this depression away. Like, it's not just pray the depression away. Right. And I, I mean, case in point for me, I was medicated or uh, from basically sixth, seventh grade all the way through college. I am no longer medicated. Um Am I going to say, well, I'm like cured of my depression? Well, no, but I believe that God has worked through medication, through counseling, um, through just better mental focusing for me to be able to develop uh, more, um, cont- uh, what do we call it? You know, more, more ways for me to regulate some of the issues that I was going through without medication. Do I know that medication is a call away? And I could go, yeah, I'm going through a time and I'm, I'm going to need to talk to somebody. Yes, of course. But I believe, like you said, that that getting involved in church and starting to take my faith more seriously and being involved in faith has helped me with that. I think others would say so as well. And I think the fact that you're bringing those things up, you know, there are recovery ministries, there's a Celebrate Recovery or, um, you know, some of these other recovery ministries that do it. Like All sorts of them. God is using that to help heal you because... Uh, not to get cliche, but whenever two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. And so he is there helping you through those situations as well. And we like to, I don't say we like to, but we often bag on the super conservative approaches to Christianity and church. But um, this next one that I think we got right is one that the opposite side might not like to hear um, that our progressive friends might not love hearing And that's that at times, some of our mental health issues are caused by the sin in our lives Mm -hmm. and that there are times that the first step, the starting point of our mental health is repenting of those sins and taking those sins to God. Um, It's not the end game, but there 
we do need to repent. There are times like for me, I go back um, and part of my depression, a large part was I was not doing what God called me to do. And mm. so the purpose that God had laid out for my life, I was not living up to that. I was not pursuing that. And because of that, I was not living life in life to the fullest. I was not doing the things I was supposed to do. So strangely enough, once I repented of that, and started doing what God was calling me to. I actually, I remember I was laying in bed one night and I said, God, I don't want to do this. I do not want to go into ministry, but if this is something you want me to do, I give you permission to change my heart. Right. And that permission is what he needed. And then God started to work, but it was also Mm -hmm. through conversations with people. And I never got actual clinical counseling at that point, but I did get um, just Christian counseling from other people and other leaders and, um, seminary professors and those things that, that between the two, those two things, my depression at the time got better. And as I've gotten older and actually gone to real counseling and real coach, like real therapy stuff, like a lot of times the first step is repenting from things that I'm doing. Um, and great counselors have brought some of those things up before that there were blind spots. I didn't know that I was that I had in my life that I didn't need to repent. And so that is something we have to think about that whenever you are going through a mental health time, um, a question to ask, this is not the root of it at all times by any means, a question to ask is, is there something I'm doing I need to repent of? Mm -hmm. And if so, that's where you start your anxiety, your mental issues, may come from trauma and trauma Mm -hmm. is not your fault. You do not need to repent from traumatic events that happened to you. So I want to make sure that you hear me. I'm not, I'm not blaming you for what you're feeling. I'm just saying that at times, some of our mental health issues are caused by the sin in our life. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. And I think the other thing is like, um, even using that unhealthy term of like, suck it up and deal with it. That comes from a space of, if we're talking about the good out of it, if we could pull the good out of it, the well-meaning side of someone telling me, Eric, you got to suck it up, isn't ignore it and move on. It's you've got to do something about it. You can't just sit and say, oh, I'm like, I can't say I'm a depressed person. Therefore, I can't do these things, right? No, that's that's not, at least not for me. I can't sit there and go. Your identity is not your mental health issue. Yes. You put it. That's, that's exactly right. Your identity is not your mental health issue. Um, there may be different levels of what that looks like as far as being able to overcome it. But if I look back and look at my son, you know, and I think we've shared this last season, like, um, when he was four weeks old, we were told he may never walk. He may never hold a job. He may never, you know, have any meaningful relationships. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, you know, so that's the kind of thing where it's like, at some point, I had a trusted friend and advisor when, when my wife and I were in the middle of just mourning for the loss that we thought we had tell us, you know, you got to move forward. You got to have a funeral for what you think and now move forward and do the best with what you can now. And that wasn't like, don't think about the mental health aspect of it, but it was, we can't dwell in our we can't dwell in our mourning or our depression. We have to take steps forward and we can't look at him and say, he has mental health problems. And so we're not going to do anything about it. So we gather up specialists and everybody else and it's suck it up and deal with it. And not in the way of like, don't feel it, but it's move, make progress in this area, do something about it. And so one of the things that, It sucks to hear at the time, but I'm hoping we can convey this in a healthy way. Um, Mm. Your identity is in Jesus. It is not in your mental health issue, like I mentioned a second ago. And in the church, I think growing up, we said that the wrong way. Like, that's a true statement. Like, Mm -hmm. but we, we didn't say that with grace and love. We said it out of shame and like, hey, stop being so depressed. You're, you're a child of God. You're, you shouldn't have to deal with that. Anytime you say shouldn't, that there's shame involved. But Mm -hmm. I think about how um, how the British talk about people with different type of issues. Um, They are not an alcoholic; they are someone who deals with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. They are not depressed; they are someone who deals with depression. 
And so I think where we got it right is the truth is you are not a depressed person. You struggle with depression. You are a child of God who struggles with depression. You are not a depressed person. You are not an anxious person. You are a child of God who struggles with anxiety. And so mm-hmm. when we think about ourselves in that way, that is a, if we do it right, that is a call to something bigger, not a shameful statement, but it's mm-hmm. all in how we present that. Yeah, I think, so this was a, a quote that I got from uh, Ben It's Stewart. not another Rob Bell quote, is it? No, it's not another Rob <laughs> Bell quote, but it's- Because <laughs> I've quoted him way too much recently. Well, I brought up Ben Stewart in uh, two, you know, this season already, but uh, you know, he had a great- um, he, he had a great analogy that he brought up as far as what it, what it, what happens when we struggle, what happens when we're going through these things. And he, he talked about the idea of a battlefield, right? And he says, he says on a battlefield, there are two different types of people on the battlefield. And I mean, this is really uh, kind of morbid, but he said, like, imagine uh, saving private Ryan. He says on a battlefield, there are two types of soldiers. Like some, they look quiet. They look peaceful. Others look agitated, bothered, fearful. One type are like serene, they're calm. The other is like super anxious. He says, the difference is that one type is dead and dead people aren't even aware that the battle is waging around them. Dead people don't flinch when the bullets fly by or the bombs go off. Dead people don't flinch and struggle with adversity. The living are the ones that struggle. The living and the struggle shows that we're alive. And so that was like really eye-opening for me on this. And I go like, okay, rather than me feeling like I need to be calm and peaceful about everything and have a peace that goes beyond all understanding, which I know that's what God gives us, but you know, you skew it in a way that makes you seem like you shouldn't struggle. When in reality, the struggle is the sign that you're alive and the struggle is the sign that you're still working to make progress on these things. And that just made me feel um, a lot better about knowing that my ident- I'm still on the battlefield. My identity is still in Christ and I am still you know, doing everything that I can. And part of the agitation is because it's a sign that there is a piece of me that, that still wants to live and be alive and, and fight for something. So where do we go from here? Like what if if you were counseling someone right now, the person listening to this and they struggle with mental health or they're wanting to teach people about mental health, where would you suggest they go? Uh, yeah, first of all, it depends on where you're at. But if you are in church leadership and you're in leadership of any type, you need to be a, you need to be an advocate for destigmatizing depression and mental health issues. If you are uh, someone who's gone through that and now you're in this process of deconstructing your faith and figuring out what that looks like, understand that there is faith in Christ while also acknowledging uh, depression, mental health issues, and acknowledging that therapy and faith can coexist. I think those would be two of the main things. Um, I think we've talked about it before is like, you have to be able to share your struggles uh, because it shows that other people aren't alone. It's that whole idea of representation. And that's been huge for other, um, you know, other marginalized communities. But in one case, there's a marginalized community within the Christian church, and that is people who struggle with mental health issues. And I think the more that we can be advocates and the more that we can represent that group uh, in whatever platform that we have, the better off that we're going to be. And as we think about training the next generation, whether it be our students, our kids, or or whoever, um, we have to let people know about our struggles and so they can see it. Like the representation you said, my wife, um, I don't think she'll mind me saying this. She recently started back into therapy. Um, she was doing it before we moved a couple years ago. We moved to a new town right as we were getting our bearings COVID hit. And so online therapy was not something that would have been good for her. Um, so she finally got back in a couple weeks ago and has been going pretty regularly. And so on Wednesday nights, uh, my kids are, well, when's mommy going to be home? Well, she's going to counseling tonight. Well, what's that daddy? And so I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old that I'm talking to about counseling is like, and I've told my kids like, you know how we go to the gym so that we can keep our bodies healthy. Like, yeah, I was like, well, mommy's going to counseling so that she can keep her mind healthy so that she can be in a better space and not get angry and not feel sad. And so that she can help uh, be a better mommy to you guys. Mm-hmm. And I have my therapy and coaching and counseling. I do that during the day. So you guys don't see it, but I do that quite often as well. And so my kids at four and six years old are seeing that therapy and counseling 
even as a Christian, is a part of a normal life. So right. if we want to train a new generation of kids and students who don't have this stigma, we have to talk to them about it and let them know it's a fairly normal thing. Yep. And then lastly, and we'll get you out of because we're, we're, we're way long this week, so I apologize for that. Um, this is something that helps me that I don't know if it will help you or not, but um, I want to toss it out there and let you, the listener, figure it out and see if it will, will be something that helps you. Um, for my mental health, what I've learned is I've got three or four, like for lack of a better term, buckets that I have to be investing in regularly for my mental health to stay in a good place. For me, it is, um, I've got to be doing something creative, whether that's uh, recording and editing a podcast or it's um, flying the drone and I have a drone that I fly and take pictures and do some video stuff there. Whatever it is, I have to, like, I'm a creative person. That's the way God's designed me. I've got to be doing something creative. I have to be doing design work. I'm also a designer. I'm a web designer by trade. And so if I'm not designing things regularly, if I get into a period of time where I'm just working on the admin side of stuff all the time and not designing, whether it's web or graphics or whatever, then my mental health isn't good. Mm -hmm. I need to be teaching something. Um, One of the biggest reasons Eric and I did this podcast is because we both have a teaching desire. And so this is our way to teach right now when we don't have other outlets. So being able to teach in some standpoint and then finally leadership. Like I need to be leading something. And um, for me, sometimes that comes in consulting through my business. Sometimes that comes through leading a small group, whatever it is. But those four things, if I'm, if one of those gets too low, I start realizing I'm a little out of balance and I need Mm -hmm. to invest in that thing. So I don't know what your four buckets is. You may only have two buckets. You may have five buckets, but I would just, challenge you to like, would that work for you moving forward? Um, it might, it might not, but that's just something I wanted to toss out and see, um, just cause I want to help you. Yeah. I think for, for me, there's a, um, there are different things that, that happen in my life that my wife can point to and go like, Hey, I'm noticing this going on with you are you okay? Do you need to talk to somebody? You know what I mean? And so those are some different things like that. My wife knows that if certain stuff happens, if I'm saying things, if I'm reacting in a way that I shouldn't be reacting, um, you know, those are markers for her to speak into and go like, well, okay, here, the, the canary in the coal mine type of deal. What, what do we need to do here? And, or do you need to talk to somebody? So, you know, like, like we've talked through in other episodes and talked about today, like, uh, you know, going through the passing of a loved one or having somebody that's, that's, uh, got a diagnosis that's terminal that you're going through, you know, there are also seasons where even if the, if the buckets aren't full, there are some times where you just need to look at certain seasons and say, it's okay for that. And in fact, you might want to do preventative, uh, Mm -hmm. maintenance in that area. Um, instead of just trying to assume that you're going to power through, because for me, once I get to the point where those red flags are going off, that's, it's not like it's too late, but it's too late. I shouldn't, you know, I should have stopped it sooner or seen someone sooner or talked to someone sooner. When my dad got his cancer diagnosis last spring, one of my first things I did was reach out to my counselor and say, Hey, like, I'd like to get an hour with you. Um, I'm good right now. But I need to know what what should I be looking for? You know my personality. You know my my red flags, my trigger points. Like, what are the things I need to keep an eye on so that I can stay healthy through this whole process? Because mm-hmm. you get a terminal ca- t- cancer diagnosis, like it's not going to be good. There's going to be right. times like we know the end game, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but what do I need to be looking out for during that process? And again. That's just the beauty of being in community with people. God designed us to be with, in community with other people. And so maybe it's not a counselor. Maybe it's not therapy. Maybe it's just a small group at church, but we do need to be around other people. This idea of individualistic, I can do it on my own. I don't need other people. That's not what God designed us for. And we're not going to be healthy if that's the way we approach life. Right. So that was heavy. <laughs> Sometimes like I'm an Enneagram seven. So when I get too heavy, I just got to laugh a little bit. So um, next week we're going to laugh because next week we're talking about how in youth group, 
mission trips were vacations. Oh yeah. And, um, I have seen some incredible stuff on TikTok about that. Yeah. Um, but we'll dive into more of that next week. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the show. Leave us a rating, a review. Um, if you've got thoughts or comments on this, if you listened to it, you liked it, you hated it, uh, reach out to us. I'm Jonathan underscore Corone on Instagram. Eric is Eric W712. W712. Uh, reach out. We would love uh, just to build a relationship with you and to continue these conversations uh, in more of a dialogue than a monologue. So mm-hmm. uh, that's it for this week. We hope you have a great week and we will see you next week for episode five. Have a great week. Do, 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 boom. Damn, I'm glad I didn't peek in high school. Do, 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 do. Okay. Damn, I'm glad I didn't peek in high school.